Well, today uh, we are in part three of our series called The Beginning of Wisdom. Uh, I heard Jennifer did a great job last week. All right. You know, if you were in my house when she prepares and gets ready to do messages, you'd, you'd realize how brutal of a process it is for her to get up and do that. But uh, glad to see that she made it again. Um, so I, I think all of us would agree that we live in a day where everyone is claiming some kind of personal wisdom, but we would maybe question whether it's wisdom at all. I think we agree with that, right? Um, sometimes I watch the news uh, and I'll flash back and forth from the major news networks, and I just I, I shake my head with the opinions and the thoughts and the things that are going on in our culture and our world today. And so this series is really kind of addressing where everybody has the opinion to maybe coming to the opinion that God has and trying to figure out how to interact with that. Um, so where does wisdom come from? That's what we're asking during this series. How, how do we get it? How, how can we maintain it? And so we're exploring together how to truly become wise. And I'm assuming, this is an assumption on my part, that you're here today and you desire wisdom. You, you desire that, which is actually part of the Proverbs statement for those that are wise. That It starts with a desire, which I believe, personally, God puts that in our hearts to begin with. So you've already got something that God's doing in you, that you're here and you're wanting to be wise. So our key text is in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. And it simply says this, it says, the fear of the Lord the fear of the Lord. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. The fear of the Lord is this idea of respect and reverence, this, this understanding of the greatness and the, and the beauty, the majesty of who God is. It isn't this shame hiding in a corner kind of fear. It's this healthy fear that God wants us to have. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So my perspective, Perception or my view of who God is, is directly connected to my ability to have wisdom in life. It goes on, it says, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And as I read through that, and this is what I do as I prepare messages, I just kind of go back to the key text and pray and say, Lord, what are you saying to us? And, and as I was reading through this uh, this week, I was thinking there is a beginning point to our wisdom, and it's not me. I think that's an important place for us to start today, that we would realize that maybe wisdom is out there to be gained, but it's not going to originate or start with me. It's actually going to come from and originate with God. And I need to understand that first and foremost, that maybe I need to put some of my opinions aside so that I could truly grab a hold of wisdom. And the other thought I had was this, is we desperately need a holy revelation. You know, I've been praying for this whole series that we would have a revelation of how big and how great and how grand God is and how we relate to his bigness, that we would have that and that we need that desperate re holy revelation. So our starting point for wisdom must come from an accurate understanding of who God is. And if you were here, like I said, the first week, if you weren't, go, go online and listen to it that God is altogether holy, that God is completely in charge, that God is the final authority or the ultimate judge. And so we understand that accurately and then it allows us to step into this idea of wisdom. So as we accurately view God, then it gives way to a response with an appropriate behavior. So week one, we talked about the fear of the Lord. I see the Lord correctly. He's high and lifted up. His majesty and his greatness, his power, his authority, his, all the things that God is. And because of that now, I have a response that takes place within me. And last week, we talked about the response of worship. I worship out of response for who God is. And today, I want to talk about another one of those. And that is a wise response of honor, of honor. Check out this verse in Micah chapter 6, verse 9, it's the very first part of that verse. And it says this, it says, The voice of the Lord calls to the city. The voice of the Lord calls to you. The voice of the Lord calls to you. And notice then what it says, And the wise person, say it with me, honors him. The wise person honors him. And so what does that mean for us today? If, if, here's the whole statement of today's message is very simply this. Wise people hear the voice and choose to honor. Wise people hear the voice of the Lord and choose to live a life of honor. It's this idea that I'm going to make that happen. So my prayer today is, Lord, may we choose honor as a congregation, as individuals, because, and let's just be honest again, we live in a toxic time of dishonor. 
I think right now, I was at the Nebraska game, like I said yesterday, and, and it kind of struck me a little odd, and maybe I'm, I'm a little sensitive to different things because of the world that we live in right now, that some of the Minnesota fans had t-shirts that said, we hate Iowa. Sorry, Iowa people. But in the middle of the Nebraska game, the whole Minnesota crowd started chanting that. I was like, this is really odd, you know? I think, okay, must be the world we live in. I didn't start chanting it with them, even though, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I, you guys assumed that I was thinking or th- saying what you thought I'd said that I thought that I said. That. Anyway, but it's just, we just live in a toxic time. We just live in a toxic time of dishonor. And it almost seems to be acceptable instead of us choosing and saying, you know what, maybe that's not quite right. Maybe that's not quite right. Maybe we shouldn't live that way or act that way in how we do life. So here's an interesting thing. If you read through Proverbs, and we're kind of hanging in Proverbs for this whole series, you'll notice that there's the fool. The fool. We talked about the simple, the fool, the mocker, and the wise. And there's the fool, and the fool has characteristics that are opposite of the fear of the Lord, which keeps him from experiencing wisdom. It's one of those characteristic things that really causes problems. Notice what it says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. It says, The fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. In kind of the same statement as our key text. But then notice what it says. It says, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. And and so it says fools despise, which means, and so you unpack that a little bit, this is what it means. To be in contempt of. To be in contempt of. Or or to have a view that this is beneath me. That that I'm better than that idea or that opinion. And and this beneath me, or another way to say it is it's disrespectful. Or to scorn, which is interesting, to despise is to have an open dislike. And I'm going to voice my opinion about as loud and clear as I can. That I'm going to do that, that that I have this scorn. Or, Or to consider worthless. And the last definition of the fool despises, or the idea of despise, is to be unworthy of honor. That that's the fool. The fool has lost touch with this concept and this idea of honor in life actually is what is the right response to wisdom and to the fear of the Lord. And so here, here's that idea. Here's another Proverbs. Check out what it says in Proverbs 10, verse 1. It says, the Proverbs of Solomon, which, by the way, let me explain something. The first nine chapters of Proverbs are actually a definition or declaration of the importance of wisdom and getting a hold of it and grabbing it. And then Proverbs 10 and on are actually the Proverbs, okay, the wise statements of Solomon. So it says the Proverbs, <clears throat> excuse me, of Solomon, a wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son brings grief to his mother. Now, I thought maybe I'd get an amen from some of the parents. All right? We, we know that as parents, right? We know that when that happens, what that feels like. We, we get that as parents. And here's the point of this, this verse. The point is wisdom is connected to honor. Wisdom is connected to honor. The absence of honor is what actually brings grief in life. It brings grief in the home. It brings grief in the marriage. It brings grief in our society. It brings grief, sadness. And and so this absence. And so for many of us here today, the difference between being wise or being foolish is connected to our willingness to embrace a lifestyle of honor. Just a lifestyle of honor. So I want to take a few minutes here today and just kind of unpack what honor means and maybe how we can begin to act that way and live that way. And, and so let me start off with some basic truths, all right? Some basic truths about honor, all right? Here, here's the first one, that honor is applying the appropriate value to someone. That's honor. Appropriate value. Now, this last week, I, I had to go out to Lexington, Nebraska, to do some meetings with some, a group of pastors. And we got done early, and we're about 45 minutes from where my grandmother lives. She's 95, I think, now. She's getting older. She's beginning to lose her memory a little bit. She's in a home. And so every chance I get, I get close there. I just drive down the 45-minute drive. It's out of my way. And I walk in, and I, and I just happen to walk in this time. And I never know if she's going to know me or not. But, but I walk in, and as soon as I walk in the door, she's sitting right there at the table finishing her lunch. And she gets this big smile on her face, and she goes, Troy! And she always calls me the preacher. 
you know? And I'm like, hi, Grandma, you know? And so I go, and I, I sit down beside her, and she takes my hand, and she would not let go. She would not let go. I mean, I, I sat there, I kneeled down on the floor for a while, and then, then I sat in the chairs at, at, at the table, and, and she's just, hold on, she's just happy as all get out, because I was just there just to say hi to her, you know, just to honor her. She said, why don't you come back to my room? And so we went back to the room, and I'm thinking, man, i got to get going, you know? I mean, but I thought, you know what? Let's go for it. So we go back. We're talking. We're flipping through photo albums. We're, I'm, you know, I'm telling her who all my kids are again, you know, that kind of thing. And it's just, it's just that moment of honoring, not because she was giving something to me, but I was just there to give something to her, honor. And I remember that I get ready to go, and she's, oh, no, 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 I want you to meet some people. I was like, oh, man. So I'm pushing her in a wheelchair. She's introducing me to every person. This is my, my grandson, Troy, the preacher. <laughs> it's annoying, but anyway, I love it. But it's honor. It's honor. And that's a really small picture of it. But why is that? It's because it's applying the appropriate value to someone. My grandmother matters, not because she's so smart right now. Not because she has so much wisdom to add to my life. It's because she's valuable. And see, some of us, we need to hear that again. And we're going to talk about how it applies to God too. So, so honor is based on seeing God and people. It's both with the right perspective. It's placing the right value on those around us based on God's value of them. Not my value. I mean, because a lot of times we, we, we devalue. But God values, he lifts up, he, 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 he highlights the value of who, who a person is. It's on his determination and definition of people, not mine. You see, God sees every one of us in our total depravity. God sees the, the mess ups, the screw ups, God sees all those things. But here's what's so cool about how God sees us. He also sees us with our total dignity. At the same time, God sees our depravity and he sees our dignity. And that's the way we're supposed to see the people around us, not just in depravity, because we're really good at seeing all the things that are messed up and wrong, right? But we need to be able to see the way God sees and value the way God values. It's appropriate value of someone, the way God sees them. Now, it's things like God sees our brokenness and our possibilities. God sees our weakness and our greatness at the same time. So what is honor? Let me give you just kind of a definition here. It comes from the Hebrew word kabed or kabod, which many times if you've heard, it's that word for glory sometimes. It's actually a word that has a lot of different meanings. But for honor, it really deals with this, to place value, to give worth, and I love this one, to have weight. To have weight. To have weight. There's, there's a weightiness to it. And so referring to God, it has to do with his glory and his splendor and his majesty. It has this weight. And even sometimes if you've ever been in these moments where you meet with God, you have that sense of a heavy presence. It's the weight of God. It's his kabod. It's the kabed, if you will, of who God is. So in other words, then for us, honor means recognizing the weight or the worse, or worse the worth of a person. In other words, the person you're sitting next to is very heavy in the sight of God. This is the only point you might ever get to say this, but look at the person next to you and say, you are heavy. (laughs) And that's because we value you so much, right? Right, right, right. It's this idea of weight and value that we add. That's that's the idea of honor. And now... Now, here's a little little note that I want to throw out here. Honor does not mean that I have a blind passivity to the circumstances and situations of life. I mean, sometimes we might confuse that. Or let me say it another way. Honor does not mean that I become a doormat. All right? I mean, there's, there's some boundaries and there's some understanding to what that means. And so I don't want to convey that thought. So what's the opposite? Dishonor is the opposite, which is interesting because dishonor means to take lightly and the opposite of kabed or kabod is actually kaleo. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, which means to curse or to devalue, to put down, to curse. And here's an interesting thing. I, I, I stumbled across this, that studies have shown that those who are raised in homes where honor is taken lightly or there's dishonor, 
as part of the family upbringing on a more often than not basis, they experience significant higher levels of, notice this, narcissism, which is self-focus, disrespectful behavior to those that should receive honor, and, and this one's interesting, future regret. In other words, there, it, it's, it's making it all about me. <laughs> I'm not treating the people around me very well. And as I get later on in life, I really regret that I did that in the first place, and now I'm unhappy. All because of dishonor and what's going on. Here, here one more thought about applying appropriate value. is when we apply the appropriate value to each other, we are actually honoring God. So when I went to my grandmother's, I didn't think about this until I was preparing messages and stuff this week. I was actually glorifying God in the moment, not just my grandmother. I was honoring what God said is valuable. I was honoring what he said was important. That's what I was doing. I was taking his creation and saying, Lord, you've done well. And honoring that. And so check out this verse, Proverbs 14, verse 31. It says, whoever oppresses the poor, dishonors, shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy, notice what it says, actually honors God. So the appropriate value thing isn't just, well, I, I value you because I have to. It's actually I value you because that's what God said is happening right here, and I want to respect what God says. So honor. Here's the second basic truth, is that honor benefits me as much as those I'm honoring. It benefits me just as much as those I'm honoring. I mean, Again, I'll go back to my grandmother's little, I didn't think anything about it when I did it. I was just doing it because that's what I do. But you just have this feel-good thing, you know? You just have this feel-good thing. It's like, yeah, that felt really good. You know, I even called my dad because I wanted to spread the honor, not to brag about it. I'd say, hey, I just went by and, and visited grandmother because they they're not able to get up there and visit her very much. He said, oh, I bet they, she so loved that. Yeah, I said, yeah, she'll be talking about it for a couple weeks, bet. He said, no, no, it'll be two or three months. She'll just keep talking about it. <laughs> Troy, my grandson, the preacher came by. Hey, you know. I mean, because there's this benefit that pours out into our lives and those around us. You know, and it might actually have more of a positive effect on me than even on them. And could it be, let me just ask this, could it be that the lack of blessing in my life or your life is direct, directly related to a lack of honor in my life? Could it be that the sadness and the, the upsetness many times that we experience in life is just related to the fact that we don't give honor and we don't get the benefit? We don't get that sense of, wow, that really felt good. Notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 6. This is based on a scripture in Deuteronomy, one of the Ten Commandments. It says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And notice this, that it may go well with you. That it may go well with you. And, and that you may enjoy long life on earth. See, the benefit comes back to you when you honor. And so that's one of the truths about honor. Here's the last one. And then we'll get into a couple other thoughts. Is that honor is something we choose to give. We choose to give it. We choose to give it. It's not something that's earned. You know? And again, I'm going back to my grandmother. My grandmother, it wasn't something that she'd earned. I mean, she'd love me. I, I joked with her when we were talking at the table, and the, the little nurse assistant person came around, and I said, Hey, Grandma, you remember when we used to give me full tubs of mir Miracle Whip whipped cream and let us just eat it however much we wanted? You're the best grandma ever, right? You know? It's just like, and, and this was her face. She goes, I did? Why would I do that? You know? <laughs> but, you know, anyway. But it's, it's the choosing to give part of it. You know, it's not something that you earn. It's not based on what a person deserves. If you only honor those that deserve to be honored, nobody probably deserve, would be honored, to be honest with you. Because we all have frailties. We all have mess-ups. We all have problems. We all have stuff. We all have things that are really not right. And so it would disqualify us. So it's got to be something else, right? It's got to be a choice. So trust is earned. Trust is earned. But honor and respect is something we choose to give away. We choose it. We just choose to honor. We choose to elevate. We choose to value. We choose to do this. Here's... Here's the next thing I want to talk about, is that there's, there's different types of honor in the Bible. Different types of honor in the Bible, all right? First one, and this is the most important one, 
is there's vertical honor. Vertical. Vertical honor. It's the honor of the Lord. That's where it all starts. I mean, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the honor of the Lord, the vertical honor, is where it all starts. If I can't get that right, I'm going to struggle with these other parts of it that we're going to talk about in a few minutes because it's not going to make sense. It's not going to apply. It's not going to fit. And it's not just because I have to honor him, again, because he is deserving of it, because I mean, because he is. I mean, it's just this idea that God is incredibly worthy of it. So I start with this idea that he's not like anybody else. Remember, we talked about he's altogether holy. And so this idea of honoring the Lord is based truly on he does deserve it. He is worthy of it. And he is majesty. And he is all these things. So I start at this vertical place and everything flows from there, from this vertical recognition of who God is. Check out Isaiah 25. It says, Lord, you are my God. It's very personal. It's a vertical, personal relationship. I honor you and praise you because you have done amazing things. You deserve it. So the vertical honor that is with the Lord is truly based on the quality and the character of who he is. Not like anything else that we're going to talk about in a little bit because it's different. It's a vertical honor. He goes on, he says, you because you have done amazing things, you have always done what you said you would do because of your faithfulness because of your goodness, because of your truth, that you just you, you remain the same. You don't have a bad day. You don't have a day where you just lost it. You're always that same way, same God. You have done what is what you planned long ago. And so it's based on this idea of who God is. It's vertical honor. That's number one. Here's the second one, and that's horizontal honor, which that's where we live a lot more, right? I mean, obviously, you got to have the vertical, but the horizontal the horizontal is this idea of, of honoring. It's twofold. It's twofold. Honoring those around you and honoring those in authority over you. Honoring those around you and honoring those that are in authority over you. Now, how many of you are a little bit like me that sometimes when I'm pushed by authority, I buck? Any, any buckers out there? There you go. Good. Yeah. You're the ones that if somebody says, go do this, you automatically say no. I mean, it doesn't even matter what it is, right? You know, it doesn't matter. You just, whatever you want me to do, you know, I'm not going to do it. Don't, you're not going to tell me what to do, you know? Forever, I had with Jennifer, my, my one line with her is, you're not the boss of me. And I'm realizing that's not exactly true. And so this idea of, of those around you and honoring those in authority over you. Notice a couple verses here. Romans 12, verse 10. It says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. So this idea of horizontal honor is based on love. I care about you. I care about you as a person. Going back to I appropriately value who you are as a person. Doesn't matter if I agree with you, I value you as a person. Doesn't matter if I see everything the same way, I still value you as a person. So because of this love idea, and it goes on, it says, honor one another above yourselves. So it's this idea that I'm not trying to elevate myself, I'm actually trying to elevate you. This is that horizontal love of those around you. By the way, this is a very important little piece about marriages that work great. Marriages work great with this kind of idea. Here's the second one. This one has to do with those in authority. 1 Peter 2, 13, the first part of verse uh, 13 says, submit yourselves to the authority, to every human institution, which is the authorities, for the sake of the Lord, to honor his name. So here's the, here's the point. So you obeying traffic laws actually is honoring God. So all of you that sped to get to church this morning, <laughs> Lord, I just pray for a repentive heart, God, to come. <laughs> You're right. I mean, so this idea that I would respect those that God has, and it says in Scripture that He's placed them in those positions of authority. Now, again, it isn't. It isn't that I agree with everything, but I'm honoring the value and the position of those that are in authority over me to the point where I can actually live a life of honor. 
And then I get into this whole idea of what that means. All right, here's, here's, here's the third one. So first one, vertical honor. I got I to gotta make sure that's there because the rest of it isn't going to make sense. Horizontal honor with those around me, the family, you know, it's husband, wives, kids. I mean, it applies to everything, you know, and then authorities. And then this next one is interesting. And that's this idea of individual honor. Individual honor. And, and I think this one's interesting because I think for a lot of us, we just want people to think that we're honorable, even though maybe something inside of us isn't. But see, the Lord's interested in my vertical honor of who he is. I want to recognize his character. I want to have a horizontal honor that is respecting and honoring those around me and those in authority over me. But many of us miss this last one is we don't have individual honor. Sometimes it's called integrity. Sometimes it's called things like purity or innocence about who we are as people. And that part of the honor process actually throws us into the foolish thing. We're not really wise because we haven't addressed this area. Maybe we're really good at the vertical honor. Lord, I love you. You're worthy. You're awesome. Horizontally, we kind of don't like people. We hate Iowa, you know, that kind of thing, right? But individually, (laughs) I'm a mess when it comes to honor. I'm a mess when it comes to honor because I've allowed this pattern of lifestyle to continue. Or I've excused this behavior for so long, it's just become part of who I am. And we've missed something here that God is saying, this is honor, individual honor. So our personal honor, to live honorably, it has to do with, and check this out, it has to do with being pure and set apart for God. Those two, thought, two, two ideas, pure and set apart. Personal individual honor has to do with me understanding that God wants me to be pure. That he wants me to live a life that in no shape or form is tainted or stained or, or marred, if you will, by anything that would make me unpure or impure. that we would have that. And then I would be able to be set apart. In other words, now I'm useful. See, that's individual honor. And see, some of us, we just need to rethink, am I really living in that life of individual honor, that integrity, that heart that says, Lord, you can use me? <laughs> I don't know. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21 says this, if you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil, utensil, utensil for what? Say it with me. Honorable use. If you keep yourself pure, your life will be clean. And then notice the second part. And you will be ready for the master, the Lord, to use you for every good work. Pure and set apart. Pure and set apart. See, some of us, and I'll just be pastor for a second. We need to look at what we do in life and just say, is that pure? Because I might be actually being dishonorable just because I haven't considered it. Just because I haven't even thought about it. I haven't thought about that particular behavior or that lifestyle or that thing that I do every Friday night or whatever it might be. That somehow I've allowed something very impure to be a part of my story. And therefore I'm missing this whole idea of honor. And here's where it goes. It leads that I'm actually foolish and I didn't even know it because of this. So let me close with this This. These thoughts here. How do we do this? Three ways to honor. Three ways to honor. And honoring, by the way, going back to one of our basic truths about honor, is a choice we have to make. So these are three choices, really. These are three ways that I can honor by choosing this. And here they are. Here's the first one. is We choose to the position of honor. Choose the position of honor. And somebody asks, what is the position of honor? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad somebody asked. Um, It's priority. That's the position of honor. It's what's first. It's what's first. It's when you go, I'll give you the very practical idea. You're going up to a building. I I work out the lead center as often as I can. The other day, there was an older couple kind of moving. They were ahead of me. And my mind thought, man, I wish they'd get out of the way. But wait a minute. You know what? Why am I thinking so selfishly? 
So then I booked up in front of him and grabbed the door. And the guy said, whoa, I didn't know what you're doing. I was, I just, well, I was just trying to get the door for you. It's first, right? It's the priority of first. It's the position of honor. It's I want to make you first. I want to make you most important. I want to elevate you above everything else. Your priority. It's first. It's first. We add value and weight to someone by placing them first. So the question then is what holds first place in our lives? Because whatever first place is, is actually what you honor. That's what you honor. Here's two real quick biblical examples. One of them is, is placing a priority on the body of Christ. In doing so, you honor the head, which is Christ. So when you place a priority on being a part of his body and the church and doing the different things that God is doing, you're actually honoring the head. Here's another one. If, if, you, if you place priority on your giving, like tithing, notice this, is based on honoring God first. Proverbs 3.9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. See, it's, it's the first thing. It's the priority. It's the position. I choose what's first in my life. It's not what's left over. It's what's first. Here's the second one. So the position. Second choice that I need to make is to choose the language of honor. Choose the language of honor. Can I just rock your world a little bit? And this always freaks me out because I know this is scary. God watches and listens to every word that we speak. And I think he's taking notes. I think he knows exactly we're going to have to give an account for every word. That's a scary thought. It's very scary because some of you know what you said yesterday right? Or last week, or, you know, you've said these things. And so God watches. And every time we speak about someone in a negative light, we're actually dishonoring God and them at the same times. That's why things like gossip or criticism or slander or judgment is such a big deal to God, because it's the language of dishonor. It's the language. So right now when I'm watching the news and I'm hearing all the conversations, the language on most of the things that are going on in our culture right now is dishonor. There's a bad language. It's not cussing necessarily, but it's cursing. It's it's this idea that I'm dishonoring those. I'm I'm being critical and I'm slandering and I'm judging and and I'm I'm pointing out all the flaws and I'm doing... I have a language problem. For some of us, the beginning of wisdom is simply beginning to honor people with our tongues. And see, honor has a language and it's twofold. There's two things. And I don't, you can write them down, but the verses are there. First of all, is the language of praise. To elevate. I was at uh, the, the phone store last week or two weeks ago. My phone was messing up and I was in there and there was a lady in there with her like five-year-old, three-year-old, maybe a one-year-old, I don't know, three little guys, three little guys. And and they were kind of being a little crazy, you know? You, you, You know the moms? Okay, all right, right? And they were. But as she was talking to them, every time she would speak, my heart would sink. Every time. Because she was cursing. She was just saying, devaluing you don't do that. You, you worthless. I mean, it was like, I was like, I, 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 mean, I can't, I don't know. It was just over the top and the whole place was watching the same thing I was watching. And I'm like, oh man. And I don't know what to do about that. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what you do about that. Do you just look down? Do you like, I don't know. But I knew it was wrong. I knew that there was something. It was the language. It was the language that wasn't praise. It was the language of devaluing. It was the language of cutting. It was the language of sarcasm. It was the language of hate. It was the language of mean. It was this ugly language that was not elevating. And we desperately need a language of praise. No matter what. To lift people up. Here's what it says in James chapter 3, verse 9. It says... With our tongues, we praise our Lord and Father. Yet with the same tongues, we curse people. We devalue them. We deject them. <clears throat> Which is in, And notice this little next phrase. Who were created in God's likeness. Going back to the very thing we started with, that we understand it appropriately, accurately, the value of someone. 
Praise and curses come from the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, this should not happen. This should not happen. We are hurting one another. We are destroying one another. The dishonor is causing us problems within and without. It's causing us problems. This should not be. And then there's the language of thanks. It's the language of praise. Psalm 69 verse 30 says, I will praise God in a song and will honor him by giving thanks. 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 Lord, thanks for that difficult person at work. Lord, I thank you. <laughs> You're using them to sharpen me. <laughs> right? Lord, I thank you for that neighbor that just is always a pain in the rear. Not you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for my wife and her gift in this. Thank you. Thank you. Here's an interesting thought. Kids who learn to say thank you, and I heard this on the radio a month or two ago and it caught my attention. Kids who learn to say thank you, genuinely say thank you, like they really are appreciative of what they have and what they've been given, and they learn how to do this, learn gratitude. And grateful people end up becoming happy people. I wonder if how many of our problems today in people being sad and depressed and bummed out all the time are simply because they never learned how to give thanks and because they never learned how to give thanks, they never learned how to be grateful and because they're not grateful, they're always depressed because they don't have what they think they should have gotten in the first place. Because thanks counteracts things like entitlement or greed or even hate. Last one, last one, the worship team can come is the action of honor. I choose the action of honor. I came up with this little acronym that we would be pros at honor, P-R-O-S, that we would be pros at honor. The P stands for that we would protect what's valuable. That we would protect it. The dishonor neglects what's valuable, but honor protects what's valuable. The R stands for respect, that we would respect people no matter who they are or what they've done or where they come from or what they think, we still respect them. We still respect them. And O stands for obedience. Honor is obedient to those in authority and ultimately and more importantly to the supreme rule of God. I'm obedient to who God is. And the last one is honor sacrificially. S serves. Serves. Proverbs 7, 2 says, Obey my commands and live. Obey my commands and live. Guard my instructions as you guard your own eyes. Let's pray. Lord, I pray today the same prayer that we started with at the beginning of the message today, that we would hear the voice of God calling us to something different. Lord, that we would hear you calling us to a different way of response. Lord, maybe we've been responding with dishonor. We've been responding with the criticism. We've been responding with the hate. We've been responding in all those different ways that are not honorable, but you're calling us to a different place. It's actually repentance. That we would repent of that way and turn to a new way and respond to the call of God. To hear your voice today, that you're speaking to us in this room. Lord, as we hear your voice, I ask that we would do the second thing, Lord, and that is to choose today to live a life of honor. That we would be a church and a people, that we would be a husband, a wife, a mom, and a dad that chooses honor because it's wise, because it's the right response. Lord, let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.